Let me read to you a passage from the 18th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 1 to chapter 19, verse 42. That's the Gospel for Good Friday, but I will only read part of it, because it's a very long Gospel, of course. St. John writes, Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. That's from John chapter 19, verses 15 to 22, which is part of the long gospel account of the Passion of our Lord on For Good Friday. What does this suggest to us? Well, you know, I once knew a person who had lived a fairly successful life as the world would regard it but, sadly, with very, li very little love for God. Well, suddenly he went down with a stroke, and for the, the last few weeks of his life, he was in constant physical agony and in tremendous anguish at his utter helplessness. All peace of mind left him. His life had crashed, and he could not understand why all this had engulfed him. His final days were for him an abyss of misery and hopeless struggle. His death, with its unhappiness, had all the appearance, to both himself and to others, of being a tragic end to what seemed an otherwise fairly successful life. You know, many years ago, <clears throat> there lived a famous psychiatrist by the name of Viktor Frankl, who was intrigued at how some people retained peace of mind and heart amid great deprivation and suffering. Others, such as the person I've just described, are virtually destroyed by it. Frankel asked, what did the former have that the latter did not? The answer, he discovered, was the possession of a sense of meaning in things. Meaning gave purpose and shed light in the darkness. Human experience, literature and philosophy all bear testimony to the fact that one of the greatest problems for man is that he suffers, and at times indescribably. From a natural point of view, suffering appears as the great blot over the whole of life and creation. It seems to have no use, making life pointless. Of course, suffering and evil are indeed a great blot on everything. God did not mean things to be thus at the beginning. <clears throat> this we know from Revelation. God has told us so. He has also told us that the biggest hand in this matter, the cause of the terrible mess that man is in, and of the evil and the suffering that is so prevalent, was and is man himself. Man caused it by sinning, by disobeying God both in the beginning and now. The result is that so much of the life of man is taken up with the work of avoiding suffering and evil. Much of the purpose and structure of the religions of man is designed to relieve and rid man of his suffering. For instance, it was an important goal of the Buddha, the Buddha's life, to find the answer to suffering in the sense of discovering the way out of it. Buddhism has this as a principal aim. God's answer to man's question about the mystery of suffering comes in the example, the teaching, and the person of Jesus Christ. 
and it is this, that Christ actually chose to suffer in the doing of his Father's will. He chose to suffer with sufferings which no human being could possibly imagine adequately. I freely lay down my life, and I freely taken up again, he said. He suffered in atonement for all the sins of the whole world, all mankind. We read that they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him. It is commonly recognized by religious people that sufferings are often punishments for sins. Well, this was certainly the case with Jesus Christ, with this difference, though, that the sins for which he suffered were not his own. Christ suffered in our stead. Christ suffered, Christ loved me, St. Paul said, and gave himself up for me. He, the sinless one, was afflicted with suffering for our sake. We see in the Gospel account of, the, of his passion and death, especially saying John, St. John, that he was not engulfed by his sufferings as someone lost in a great sea. He suffered indescribably, but he was ever the victor, turning his sufferings into the greatest of means for the achievement of his work. And this is what suffering can be for the Christian, for the one who follows Jesus. Our Lord said that the mark of his disciple is to accept suffering, sufferings after the manner of the Master. If anyone wishes to be a disciple of mine, our Lord said, he must take up his cross every day and follow me. So it is that obedient suffering is now the greatest of means of following Jesus. Just as it was the great means whereby Jesus our Lord conquered the power of sin and brought sanctity to the world, so in like manner to suffer in union with Christ will be for the Christian the greatest means of overcoming the power of sin and of growing in sanctity. To suffer with Christ and in Christ is the path to goodness. It will, moreover, be the source of doing good for others. We win blessings for others by suffering in union with Christ. Let us learn from the passion and the death of Jesus how to live and how to die, but also how to suffer and how to make our sufferings the means of our sanctification and the means of the sanctification of others. We do it by abandoning ourselves in suffering to God's will and offering up to him all the sufferings that he allows for us.